Steinle case. So a decision has come down. Illegal immigrant and seven-time felon Jose Garate, who shot and killed Kate Steinle on a San Francisco pier walking with her dad, was given credit for three years already served on the weapons felony. But he is about to be turned over to the federal authorities now, as it appears this case is not completely over. Any moment now, the federal government will take him into custody away from the sanctuary state of California, where he will face two new felony charges, giving the Steinle family one more chance at justice in her killing. In moments, I have an exclusive interview with the man who defended Zarate, public defender Matt Gonzalez. But first, Trace Gallagher joins us from our West Coast newsroom with what is going on there behind the scenes in California with this case at this late hour. Good evening, Trace. Good evening, Martha. Either tonight or this weekend, Jose Garcia Zarate will be taken into custody by federal authorities in San Francisco and taken across the bay to Oakland, where he'll be arraigned early next week in federal court for being a convicted felon in possession of a firearm. And in case you're wondering, despite San Francisco being a sanctuary city and California now being a sanctuary state, local and state authorities can no longer shield Garcia Zarate. He has to be turned over to the U.S. Marshals because he's facing a federal indictment. Remember, the reason he was able to fire the gun that killed Kate Steinle is because when San Francisco law enforcement had him in custody, instead of turning him over to immigration agents to be deported for a sixth time, they decided to set him free. Steinle's death then became a key piece of Donald Trump's immigration enforcement narrative on the campaign trail. Now in federal court, Garcia Zarate's prominent defense attorney will try to turn the tables. J. Tony Serra says he plans to argue Argue that the case against Garcia Zarate should be dismissed because it's vindictive, adding that a guilty vote for Garcia Zarate is a vote for Donald Trump. Listen. Shame on the federal government. Shame on the Trump administration. Shame on them in terms of bringing a retaliatory, vindictive prosecution. He's being made a martyr to the, from my perspective, the racistic perspective of Trump. Garcia Zarate's defense attorneys maintained the shooting of Kate Steinle was an accident, saying he found the gun on the pier and that it accidentally discharged. Although Garcia Zarate initially claimed that he was shooting at sea lions in the San Francisco Bay. If Garcia Zarate is convicted in federal court, he's facing up to 10 years in prison. If he's acquitted, he would be deported for a sixth time. Mm. Martha. Trace, thank you very much. Joining me now for an exclusive interview, Matt Gonzalez. Jose Garcia Zarate's defense attorney. Mac, good evening. Good to have you with us uh, tonight. Th those were strong words from me. Tony Serra, um, who's going to take it from here on the federal case. Do you agree with him? Well, it's not really a question for me to answer. Uh, the question of whether or not it's a vindictive prosecution is one Tony will make in court, and he's uh, committed to fighting the case as strong as he can. So, I, I mean, I, I don't understand what he is arguing. I mean, the Steinle family has every right to want to see this through to its federal uh, fruition. And the federal court certainly has every right to continue to, to follow through on these charges. Do they not? Well, I think the point that Tony is trying to make, uh, and it's appropriate for federal court, is that uh, typically the federal government doesn't get involved in a case like this. This is somebody with no weapons possession history. Um, you know, he's not a member of a gang. He doesn't just. Well, he, he's may, just he may not, not be, but he's, heavy... he's a five time, seven time convicted felon who's been deported five times. So clearly he has a prior history. Right. But it's not a serious history. Usually the feds get involved in prosecuting crimes that the state's has already prosecuted. But if the state has failed to carry it's out its duty to protect matter. the citizens of the state uh, through their sanctuary status, obviously there's been a failure here. So when the state fails, the federal government has to step in to try to, you know, find a way to, to seek justice, no? Well, yeah, but I don't think you're, you're following what I'm saying. I'm okay. saying that typically the federal government doesn't get involved in a case like this one. Obviously, they're very interested in Mr. Garcia Zarate, mm -hmm. but, but the allegation that Mr. Serra is making is that they're interested in him only because he beat the murder charges. And so the question is, is that something that they should be allowed to do? They would never have prosecuted 
this case. They had no indictment until he was acquitted of murder. Well, it, it, dual sovereignty doctrine allows for them to do this without there being any issue with double jeopardy. There's still a felon in possession of a firearm charge and an immigrant in possession of a firearm charge that they're pursuing. I, I want to play your co-counsel, Francisco Ugarte, but, who was another but, person but, but just who to, tried but to... But just to address that, Go ahead. Martha, just, just one second. All right, sure. The point isn't whether or not the federal government as a separate sovereign can prosecute someone. The answer is yes. But the question is, what happens when they treat an individual completely different than they treat everybody else? And that's the point that Tony but is But you're raising. talking about their feeling towards this case. I'm talking about whether or not they have the right to pursue it. And you don't argue that they don't have the right to pursue it, correct? You're, you're saying that you don't like their feeling, that you believe it's vindictive or that they have some other kind of agenda. But I'm saying, obviously, they have the right to do what they're doing. Well, it, if it's a selective prosecution, if they never go after anybody for their very first gun possession case, that would be peculiar, and it would be something to try to highlight in the federal yeah, court. I, I hardly think that this is a case where this is a person who, you know, is uh, not someone who has dealt with the law. He's been he's he's a five time seven time felon. He's been five times deported from this country. So, so to say that he's just sort of this, you know, innocent person who doesn't deserve this kind of scrutiny by the federal government, I think, is a bit of a stretch. Um, I, I do want to talk well, about um, the political nature of yeah. this. So uh, let me move on. This is Francisco Ugarte, your co-counsel, talking about what he sees as, as a political agenda in this case. Let's play that. Okay. This case was used as a means to foment hate, to foment division, and to foment a program of mass deportation. It was used to catapult a presidency along that philosophy of hate of others. Do you believe that Mr. Zarate has a right to, had a right to be in this country? Well, I think the point that Francisco Garte was making was that this was a case that from the very outset was a ricochet. So the bullet struck very close to where Mr. Garcia Zarate was seated. We've never seen a murder case in San Francisco that was based on a ricochet. And so uh, it only came to the forefront because uh, our current president elected to use it in his campaign. I think that's the point he was trying no, to I make. No, I think the point that he was trying, I think the point that has been made about this case is that this is an innocent woman who was walking on a pier. How this did not turn out to be a manslaughter case is, is something that is a large question for anybody who observed it closely. Um, he picked up a gun, I, I an illegal firearm, totally as an immigrant. The gun went off and Kate Steinle is dead because of it. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, the, the the supposition I, that this I, I, is just sort just some sort, part I of some will... sort of big anti-immigration agenda um, seems to belie no, the actual the, the... facts of what happened. There's no question Kate Steinle is innocent. I mean, this is a tragedy. We all wish it wouldn't have happened. But the question of somebody's immigration status when the prosecution is trying to prove premeditated murder, in effect, the courts say somebody's immigration status isn't relevant to that determination any more than an American citizen being charged in another country who say, let's say... Seems to belie no, the actual the, the, facts of what happened. There's no question Kate Steinle is innocent. I mean, this is a tragedy. We all wish it wouldn't have happened. But the question of somebody's immigration status when the prosecution is trying to prove premeditated murder, in effect, the courts say somebody's immigration status isn't relevant to that determination any more than an American citizen being charged in another country who say, let's say, overstayed their visa. Uh, that that wouldn't be an issue. Overstaying a visa in a is very different than whether being or not kicked they out. He was crime. supposed to be removed from the city of San Francisco, and that was completely overshadowed and overlooked. Uh, you know, he was not handled right, in a the, legal manner by by the state, city of San Francisco, or and, and he completely they, managed to fall through all the cracks five times after he was kicked out of the country. I can't even imagine how you would feel if that happened to someone that you loved, someone in your family. Let, let, let me just say this though. This isn't, when we talk about Sanctuary City and what caused uh, Mr. Garcia Zarate to be released, it's not the city of San Francisco fighting ICE and Homeland Security that wanted to put a detainer on him. The federal courts have actually made it very clear that they want these federal agencies to have 
a probable cause determination that somebody is not a citizen and can be deported prior to allowing the agencies just to call up a city and say, hold this person for us. So it's really federal agencies refusing to follow federal courts in California, Nebraska, North Dakota, Utah, Rhode Island. Well, That's really I mean, what this is, is a, about. It, clearly a case of someone who fell through the cracks and, and managed to pull off a heinous, uh, a heinous release of this gun that ended in her death. Um, and I know that you, for you, Represented him to the best of your ability. Uh, now it goes on to the federal to the federal system, and we'll see what happens from there. Um, Mr. Gonzalez, thank you very much. Good to have you here tonight. All right, thank you. Joining me now is David Wool, attorney and conservative commentator, who has very strong feelings about uh, this case as well. Um, David, you heard my conversation with Mr. Gonzalez. Your thoughts? Yeah, well, first of all, counsel completely ignored the issue of illegal reentry into America mm -hmm. by someone convicted of a felony. That crime alone mm -hmm. is prosecutable and results in a 10 year sentence. Forget about the gun charges were also a, a sentence that the feds will go after and go after mm -hmm. righteously. They're seeking justice. Jeff Sessions has been involved in this. He knows what's going on and he's going to do what the state authorities did not do. And by the way, this issue, Martha, of what they're talking about, uh, pros the feds jumping in after the state fails the prosecution. These very same lawyers, when the cops in the Rodney King beating case were acquitted and the feds jumped in and filed charges and got a conviction on them, they stood on their chairs and were cheering like you couldn't believe. So this is all about who's being prosecuted, not the feds jumping in after a failed state prosecution. All right, so what do you think happens now? Well, what's gonna happen now is we, he'll be detained by federal authorities. There will be an arraignment on the charges of illegal uh, reentry. Five, ten years to the sentence. This is a first. This is a novel approach. This is something that takes a lot of courage to do in California. But this guy, Jeff Jeff Stone, is the guy who can do it. And uh, believe me, he's fully committed. After seeing the Kate Steinle verdict, and after seeing my client's case, the Sandra Duran case, of course, my client's fiance being run over by an illegal who had been deported five times and killed. Yeah. So this has got to stop. And he appreciates. Uh, what it's going to take, and so I, I give him a lot of credit. Yeah, um, and we spoke to your client in that case as well. Uh, but that, right. that criminal enhancement will have no impact on the Zarate case, correct? No, it will not have uh, impact on the Zarate case, and it's going to be a very uh, uphill battle in Sacramento because obviously you know he faces a tough liberal opposition, people who view uh, people like Mr. Zarate as important to them maintaining power. Uh, but uh, Jeff is going to give it his best shot. And I'll tell you what, you may want to have him on next week because this could get very, very interesting. We will watch it. Thank you very much, David. Good to see you tonight. Thank you, Martha. So coming up this evening, the buzz about the book, Fire and Fury, now putting its author under some scrutiny. A look at the tactics and the background of Michael Wolf. Get you uh, caught up to speed on that past and present. Chris Darwalt, Molly Hemingway, and Emily Tish Sussman are here with their take tonight. Plus, there's a growing body of reporting, and the latest from The New York Times says that Mueller's case for collusion may be very thin, if not falling apart, which is what the president has long argued. Former DOJ attorney Jay Christian Adams says Attorney General Sessions should not have recused himself. He joins us with his big story tonight coming up next. What has been shown is no collusion, no collusion. There's been absolutely, there's been absolutely no collusion, so we're very happy. Breaking tonight, Fox News can confirm that White House counsel Don McGahn was one of three senior Trump administration officials who tried to keep the attorney general, Sessions, from recusing himself in the Russia inquiry. The other officials included former chief staff of staff, Ryan Priebus, and former press secretary, Sean Spicer. However, Sean Spicer is now telling us this evening that that is not the case. Still, this contradicts a blistering New York Times piece that claimed that the president was the one who personally lobbied to get Sessions to stay on the case to protect him from charges. Here now on this and other things related, Jay Christian Adams, former Justice Department attorney. Uh, good to see you tonight. Thank you hey, very Martha. much for being here. Um, so, you know, in and of itself, uh, you know, regardless of, of, of what happen. There's a couple different stories here, whether Don McCann, Don, Don McGahn was the one who went to Sessions and said, you know, we really don't want you to recuse yourself and whether these other individuals were involved. Is there anything wrong with that inherently? 
Absolutely not. Don McGahn didn't do anything wrong. There's a lot of reasons why, Martha, but among them are the fact that Jeff Sessions wasn't implicated in anything relating to the theory of this Russian investigation. It wasn't alleged that he was involved, that he directed it, that he knew about it. He just happened to be in the same building uh, without any specific information. So Don McGahn was doing absolutely nothing wrong by urging him to stay on the case, something I believe he should have. We, we He would do a much better job job of keeping Mueller from going out of control than Rod Rosenstein is doing as the deputy. Yeah, you know, it doesn't seem to me that, that the attorney for the president going to the attorney general and saying, these are the reasons why we think there's a legal case for you to not make this decision. I, you know, that, that seems to be, in my mind, just looking at it, a, a fairly appropriate role. And, you know, when you add to that, the fact that Jeff Sessions didn't, he didn't listen to them. You know, I mean, he listened to their case. They made their case whether it was one of them or three of them, or even if the president also suggested it, we know his feelings are pretty well known on the subject. Um, you know, he, Jeff Sessions decided not to go that route and went his own way. So it's not like he was, you know, pigeonholed into doing something he didn't want to do. Well, that's right. But the question is, Martha, what is the scope of the recusal? I mean, it, if it related to a, an investigation involving Russia, that's one thing. But so far, we've seen from Mueller that this investigation involves such earth-shattering events like Paul Manafort laundering money through an Alexandria, Virginia rug store, or Mike Flynn not telling the truth uh, on a question, uh, which is the, it's sort of a gotcha law, 18 U.S.C. 1001. So far, it doesn't have anything to do with Russia. And so it really raises questions as to uh, why Jeff Sessions is not involved, why he's not uh, uh, making sure that they turn documents over to Congress regarding how they relied on the, the uh, phony dossier. There's all kinds of questions that seemingly only Jeff Sessions could fix. Yeah. You know, in terms of the, the broader investigation, uh, there's a feeling now that that Trump allies are pushing these other investigations, reopening the Hillary Clinton case and the like, and trying to downplay this, this mm -hmm. Russia probe. And there's a battle going on between Republicans and Democrats on the Hill over whether or not they think that that's, that's proper. What do you think? Well, right. Chuck Grassley, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate today, uh, called for uh, a closer look at the, the Hillary uh, matters. But, Martha, there's a reason for this. There's a growing perception in the country that the Justice Department is biased, mm -hmm. that, that law enforcement is based on who you are, what your party is, uh, who, who, who you agree with politically. And when you learn the details of what happened in the campaign, where the dossier, this phony, insane dossier, was possibly being used by FBI officials to do national security surveillance on Americans and then unmasking the surveillance, it becomes a frightening story instead of a ridiculous one. And I think Congress is on to it, and that's why people like Holder and, and Comey are so nervous, because the bad behavior last year during the election uh, is really a frightening one. Yeah. Uh, you know, with regards to the relationship of the attorney general to the president, this is something that you saw firsthand in the prior administration. Administration, uh, when you were seeing things that were going on that you didn't like, there's a, a lot of sort of, um, I don't know, hysteria is too strong a word, but concern about whether or not the president should be protected by the attorney general. I just want to put up a, a quote from Eric Holder uh, in terms of the way he spoke of his relationship with President Obama. When asked if he was going to be leaving yeah. the administration, he said, well, I'm still enjoying what I'm doing. There's still work to be done. I'm still the president's wingman. So I'm there with my boy. So we'll see. What do you think? <laughs> Great find by your producers. That's a that's a perfect example of the lawless uh, sort of uh, uh, political allegiance between Holder and Obama that led to all sorts of outrages, uh, fast and furious. Uh, the city of Ferguson being lit on fire because Holder stoked a mob there that echoed the president's views on police. I mean, look, we had a situation where Holder was running interference all the time for Barack Obama. And now suddenly, suddenly, when Jeff Sessions isn't even doing it, uh, when it's only suggested the ought to, people like Holder and, and Comey and the rest of them go completely crazy. It, it shows you the bias that we're talking mm -hmm. about. It, people are not treated the same way. same way by this Justice Department and the institution of the Justice Department. The, the sort of insiders treat people differently based on their political allegiance, and that's what we're learning. Christian Adams, thank you very much. Good to see you tonight. Thanks, Martha.
So coming up Monday on The Story, uh, we have a very good guest for this uh, development. Congressman Trey Gowdy will join me on Monday evening. He's going to get a look at the DOJ documents that the House Intelligence Committee has been fighting to get their hands on for some time. They received some of those documents this afternoon. They'll continue to pour over them this weekend and into Monday, including the testimony from the FBI agents who sent the anti-Trump texts. So Trey Gowdy will join us on Monday night with more on that. In the meantime, the market closed at another record high, soaring more than 200 points after a historic climb from 24 to 25,000. But watch out. We will be keeping an eye on all of that in a moment. Also coming up, suspended ABC reporter Brian Ross, sort of back at work. He's the one who uh, did a false report. It was an inaccurate report, and it crashed the market in a matter of minutes. He's not the only journalist, though, who's under fire tonight for letting some of their personal beliefs perhaps get in the way of their coverage. Our power panel, Chris Starwalt, Molly Hemingway, and Emily Tish sussman coming up next. ABC investigative reporter Brian Ross is, in a way, back at work these days. You remember Ross was banished for a few weeks over a false report about President Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn. The story claimed that Flynn asked to talk to the Russians during the campaign. That story turned out to be false. The bosses at ABC expressed, quote, rage and disappointment in Ross, and they suspended him. He has reportedly now been put at an ABC outpost in New York. One source says that he will, quote, never be on air again. We will see if that turns out to be the case. But in other media news tonight, have you heard about the book? If you woke up this morning and walked out your front door, you've heard about the book. It's called Fire and Fury. It is about the Trump White House. Author Michael Wolff's credibility is being questioned after he said this on the Today Show. I certainly said what was ever necessary to get the story. Hmm. Wolf claims that he spoke to the president for a total of three hours over the course of this work. He claims that 100 percent of the people that he spoke to in the White House said the president was unfit, childish and, among other things, didn't like to read. But now Wolf and his tactics are getting a bit of attention. Trace Gallagher live in our West Coast newsroom with the backstory tonight. Hi, Trace. Hey, Martha, 64-year-old Michael Wolf has been in the New York media world for more than 40 years. He has written seven books, won prestigious magazine awards, and been a columnist and critic for some of the nation's leading publications. But for most of his career, he has also been accused of being fast and loose with his facts. Now, the accuracy of his new book, Fire and Fury, is also being called into question. And it's not just for the unbelievable statements like his contention that Donald Trump didn't know former House Speaker John Boehner, even though they had golfed together and spoken many times, but also for his sourcing. It remains very unclear if Wolf's White House interviews knew they were on the record. Those who know Michael Wolf claim he has a long history of burning sources and printing off record comments. For example, in 1998, Wolf wrote a book about his internet startup in the dot com bubble years, and 13 people accused him of inventing or changing quotes. The book was also replete with factual errors. Wolf himself has also acknowledged that he's not a conventional reporter. And in the opening to Fire and Fury, he writes that many of his accounts provided are, quote, in conflict with one another and may be baldly untrue, saying he settled on a version I believe to be true. But on the Today Show, he seemed incredulous to the fact that many are skeptical. Watch. My credibility is being questioned by a man who has less credibility than perhaps anyone who has ever walked on earth at this point. President Trump claims he never spoke to Michael Wolff and gave him zero access to the White House. Wolff claims he has recordings and notes of his 200 plus interviews. And we should note Steve Bannon, who offered the most explosive statements, has not yet argued that he was misquoted. Martha. All right, Trace, thank you very much. Uh, just to add to that, Jonathan Tobin wrote this in the National Review today. The proper response to a president you don't like is to campaign against him, not to lobby that he be certified insane. Trump's governing style is unfamiliar and often disconcerting, but his accomplishments are not inconsiderable. 
Wolf's book is merely political gossip and like the loose talk about the 25th Amendment should be treated as nothing more than a momentary blip on the nation's political radar. So how much sticking power does this whole thing have? Here now, Chris Starwalt, Fox News politics editor, Molly Hemingway, a senior editor at The Federalist and a Fox News contributor, and Emily Trish Sussman, a Democratic strategist. Welcome all. Great to see you all. Uh, oh, happy ma'am. New Year. So this happy book Year. is buzz, happy buzz, buzz stuff, Chris. Uh, in terms of Michael Wolf's uh, sticking up for his own credibility, uh, do you think he has a point, or do you think that these marks against him are, are egregious? Well, I think there's a, a, been a broad misunderstanding about what a book like this actually is. This is uh, this is a gossipy. This is a this is salacious. This is Wolf. This is how he does it. And there's a whole over a whole category of books like this that are gossipy, and you get people to dish on each other. And that's what this is. This is not chiseled in granite. This is supposed to be fun or exciting or interesting. Instead, it's being treated like it's the. Instead, it's being treated like this is going to be grounds for impeachment or something. Yeah, but, but that's the problem. I mean, either you take it the way that you just presented it, um, you know, on the face of it, you know, sort of People magazine-y and, uh, you know, see what you like in there. But Molly, you know, the, the question, or the point rather that Jonathan Tobin raises about the 25th Amendment, you've got people all over the airwaves today talking about how the president's obviously unfit because that's what uh, Michael Wolf says people told him at the White House. Right. And Michael Wolf is a great chatty gossip columnist. He also admits that sometimes he makes stories up. He's said that previously and in this book. You have people all the way up to Prime Minister Tony Blair saying he completely invented quotes for this book. And there are things that are sort of patently absurd, like when he says that policy wonk Stephen Miller doesn't know anything about policy. So at some point, it's kind of a gullibility test how much you're putting stock into this book. Uh, apparently quite a few members of the resistance, whether that's in Never Trump or media, are putting a lot of stock into this and they are quite gullible and they are uh, having seen the failure of their attempt to oust President Trump or uh, delegitimize his, him through the Russia investigation. Now they're moving on to this. I don't imagine they'll have as much success as they hope for. Emily. Look, I don't dispute the fact that this is, it is, the, I like what Chris, the way that Chris categorized, it's like a gossipy kind of book. Here's the thing, though, is that it doesn't actually tell us much that's new. It actually pretty much confirms what we hear over and over from reporters <laughs> and point. everyone who's coming out of the White House, that it is totally chaotic. He doesn't know how to govern. He doesn't know what's going on. He is, he is driven by his own um, importance of self. They can't control him. People at one point were saying that, that the uh, chief of staff was a success because he was good at controlling information to the president. That's crazy. If I mean, the thing that people were, a lot of people had voted for Trump, hoping the fact that he would have left these tactics on the campaign, gotten more serious to actually govern and be the president. And now they're seeing that he's really not. Look no farther than his tweets yeah. with hey, North Korea. You know people what, are concerned. I, I, you know, I, I think you make a, a good point, Emily, because in many ways, Donald Trump was better known to the American people than most people who become president of the United States. I mean, oh, yeah. everybody had watched him on TV. Everybody had watched him as a real estate developer. Um, so, so the fact that he's exasperating to a ton of people, Chris, I, I don't think it is a huge revelation. Um, the way he works, the way he approaches things, that he handles everything as a businessman and thinks that you should you know, be able to settle problems the way that businessmen do. Um, you know, that he's not a huge reader and voracious uh, devourer of, of policy wonk briefings. And none of that is, is a big shock. Right. Nobody thought he was headed to the American Enterprise Institute. Um, but I will say this. The big question about this book, the narrative that Wolf lays out here, yes, it is very much in keeping with a lot of reporting that we heard during the campaign, during the early days of the White House. The question now is, is it still that way? And has uh, Kelly, has John Kelly, the chief of staff, imposed strictures that make things work better? Uh, are people not backstabbing each other in the way that they were in the time when this book was happening? Yeah. If this is a chronicle of the way it was, that's not that big of a deal, or it's a survivable thing for the administration. <laughs> I mean, you know, the other question is, does it matter, right? I mean, to, to the American people, what do they care about? Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, they're going to look at the ledger. They're going to look at how they feel they're doing. They're going to look at whether or not they think the country's headed in the right direction. And Molly, I'm not really sure they're going to care that much about well, how exasperating or frustrating the president was for some of the people who work there. 
Right. What really separates normal people, I think, from people who have lost their head over Trump, and that's whether you're a fanatic or a critic of Trump, is how much attention you pay to the rhetoric versus how much attention you pay to the actual policies. Mm -hmm. And and if you look in terms of the policies of what's happened, people are not going to be upset with Donald Trump for what he's done in terms of deregulation or his handling of foreign policy, of corporate tax reform for the first time in 30 years. And there are these there's this segment of the population that still hasn't been able to accept the reality that the American electorate chose Donald Trump to be president. And so they're flailing about and trying to say, no, really, you have to listen to us. We don't think he's stable. They've been saying that for 30 years, I think, but it's not a message that resonates yeah. with a lot of people. And you look at, I listen to David Bossy and Corey Lewandowski, who wrote a, a book of their own account of, of that whole period of time, um, have a very different take on it, Emily. Look, they're still making money off the White House. So I think that shows there's a lot of good reason for them to have a very different take off of it. I mean, look, every person that has come out of the White House has tried to make money off of it, right? Like everyone's writing a book. And that's partly because of the fact that I, I have to imagine they feel like there's something to talk about. I would actually disagree with Molly, the fact that people don't want to know what's going on. People don't want to know how the sausage is made. I think they do. I think there are a lot of people who held their nose and voted for Trump. And I think the fact that Bannon is now kind of leading a, a revolution of Republicans for from within and turning so quickly on Trump and that Trump is turning so quickly on him really shows the state that a lot of Republicans are very uncomfortable with the fact of what they signed up for in supporting him. But Emily, don't you think it's funny that, you know, like two weeks ago, Steve Bannon was seen as this, you know, neo-Nazi crazy nationalist, but now he's a truth teller? Oh, I mean, I think all of those things can be true. I think 100 percent of those things can be true. They're not oh exclusive. Chris, 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 final word. Go ahead. Look, I'd just say Steve Bannon is the most overinflated <laughs> reputation I've ever seen in Washington. He did it himself with leaks to outlets like this, uh, and he has had his big moment. But pop goes the weasel. Pop goes the weasel. All right. Thanks, you guys. Great to see you all. You Thank bet. you. All right. Here's a very important question. Is there trouble in paradise, folks? This stunning new report on the rift in the most powerful trio in football as we head into a big, big weekend. Is it true? Plus, don't look now, but the Dow is off to its best start ever uh, for the market year. Take a look at that. Remember when Paul Krugman said that it would never, the market would never survive a Trump presidency. It was just going to fall apart. Charles Payne is here on that and the underreported story of the uptick in jobs for African-Americans in this country when Charles Payne joins me coming up. Arthritis. And our inner cities are like the forgotten man and the forgotten woman. We've forgotten about our inner cities, no longer. And the African-American community was great to us. So that was then President-elect Trump. Roughly one year later, under his tenure, the black unemployment rate has fallen to a record low of 6.8 percent. It caps up a week of stunning Action for the Dow Jones Industrials hitting another record. It's just unbelievable, right? Charles Payne's with me in just a second. Uh, this is the best start to a year since 2006, to put a finer point on uh, what I said going into the break. Charles Payne, host of Making Money on the Fox Business Network, joins me now. Um, Charles, very strong numbers we've seen over the course of the, the beginning of this year. Can it be sustained? It's actually going back to the beginning of last year and absolutely can't be sustained. In fact, the momentum is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And of course, you know, we had the jobs report. Wall Street was looking for a little bit more, but the underlying data there, including unemployment, by the way, unemployment for all sectors going really well, but black. unemployment at the lowest level ever, this goes back to 72 when they started keeping this data, is, is more pronounced than any other racial group. Uh, the participation rate is going up. They're coming back to the labor force. It is absolutely a marvel but what we're seeing in this, this country. Do you think that that, you know, let, let's look at the comparison of the, the black vote for Mitt Romney, 6%. Um, for Donald Trump, it ticked up slightly to 8%. It's typically been a, a voter group that aligns more with Democrats. Is there any chance that that changes based on any of this? I think there's a chance that, that it changes, and I, I think it's going to continue. It have to be a continuation of this, this sort of thing that we're saying. Keep in mind, though, you know, the same tide lifts all ships. So if, if President Trump does continue with this economic uh, revival that we're seeing, particularly in areas that have been hard hit, I call them dirty fingernail jobs, hard uh, manufacturing 
through the roof. Manufacturing jobs have come back like crazy. Uh, these are the sort of areas where people will fill in in their wallet, all people, but particularly blacks, Hispanics, and folks like that. And then I think it's some of the other things, obviously housing, uh, how they handle welfare reform, because remember, the mainstream media is going to portray him as being cold, cold and well, that, mean. I mean and, that, that's yeah. the ticket right yeah. there, because, you know, President Obama said these jobs are never coming back, right? Right. Um, you know, he was supposed to be, obviously, he was a transformational president in many ways as an African-American president. Um, but, but the, you know, there are people who believe that, that that group has been sort of catered to and not, you say the tide lifts all boats, but they're talked to in a different category sometimes by candidates. But, yeah. And that perhaps needs to change. I think it needs to change. I think uh, America, in the DNA of most Americans, and I'm, you know, it's, it's part of all of us, that the, the idea that we can make it, the idea that we can be anything. You know, when young kids listen to music, they, they listen to music about being bosses, about own, owning private jets. So the American DNA across the color spectrum is about success. And I think that's one of the intangibles that's coming back to the equation. It's hard to measure it, but you can see it. You see it with the manufacturing data, with the optimism data. Home builders, uh, uh, sentiment through the roof. One of the reasons why traffic, just buyer foot traffic has spiked to levels not seen in almost two decades. So Martha, it's there for all Americans. And again, you know, I think if President Trump articulates a message to black Americans, that's not unlike the message to anybody else. <laughs> Hard work, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. If I create the right economic backdrop, you can start a business. You can lift your own, t you know, you can take participate in this. So, uh, you know, he's got to worry about that. I would say law enforcement, uh, that was some rhetoric, particularly things early in the, in the campaign. Those are areas that can, can hurt the message to the community. Uh, but I, 